Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome back. It is Lee Gunlock, Eric, and Mark here with you, beauties, as we ride on into day two action from MSI 2024. When you've had so many years of international competitions, you're getting, I'm not going to say marquee, but historical rivalry matchups in this first round of playing stage Fnatic versus Gam. Levi's the only guy on either roster that has actually been there for the start of this rivalry, but it's still there nonetheless. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm giving it to it. I'm, I'm counting it. we got to be pretty lenient about what we're taking through as a rivalry on the international stage, especially when it is narrowed down at an event like MSI. Any chance you get a little bit of it in that story angle, I will take it. And for the Gigabyte Marines, you got to be leaning into that story angle, that history of having that upset, that underdog against Fnatic. Because with some substitutes, you are absolutely the underdogs in this series. Yeah, and truthfully on the day, didn't really look like a rivalry at all. I think Gam is sitting there going, Whoa, Fnatic, you're playing your main starting five? That's not fair. We've been playing against subs throughout our entire VCS playoff run. And fresh off being named the best jungler in the LEC, Razork, absolute domination on the Vi in this first game. Oh, man. Man, I think domination, I, I don't know what other adjective you could use to describe it in that type of sense, but it feels like that is too lenient, too low for us to say about how good Razork was in this game one, because you look at what happened throughout this opener, you had a lot of that testing, feeling it out, kind of trying some things, but still respecting that you don't know exactly what type of power level, what type of capabilities your opponent has on the day. After that game one, where it really was a lot of these big outplays, big fantastic performances from Razor, even with uh, Gigabyte Marines putting about a little bit of pressure, sneaking a Baron on through and getting it to be interesting, it was always in favor of Fnatic, thanks to the hand of Razor. And in game two, oh baby, we, we, we hit that dial even further. Yeah, and I mean, the Vi was, he was influencing pretty much every lane uh, across the map, obviously got Oscar in and ahead early. Um, on that Twisted Fade, and then really this was just, you could see, the subs not up to the same level as the starters on Fnatic. That was the least threatening Zeri I might have ever seen on the Rift. I, yeah, I didn't ever see it ever get that setup, never got the chance, never got the scaling going on for Zeri. That looked like about a two on the 200 years scale of Riot Champ design at that point. Yeah, it's just like a fresh little baby Zeri uh, out of the rift. But if it still took a little bit of time for Fnatic to close this one out, it went north of 30 minutes, but definitely felt like they were feeling out the opposition because game two, even though we're getting this nice little spice out of Gam, the brand jungle support Vigar, Fnatic says, ah, perfect time to just lane swap and utilizing the TF kind of perfectly in this one because he's a walking stun bot even at level one when you're lane swapping and he's going to catch up so much quicker with that incredibly annoying passive and it helps when your uh Cassante obviously watch some Zeus vods and comes in to die twice oh not not a good thing uh to be watching the Zeus Cassante vods not exactly the the game tape you need to be focusing in on before this matchup. I think the important thing to talk about when you're looking at this game two composition for Fnatic, and yes, there is a little bit of an interesting one on the side of Gigabyte Marines, as you already mentioned about the Vigar. You go to Fnatic, and I'm talking about that mobility that is there on this roster. You mentioned about being able to lane swap. You got the Twisted Fate ultimate, of course. Talia, she can go anywhere she wants around Summoner's Rift, get there mighty quick in, in a lickety split type of situation. You go to the bottom lane, Zaya. And Rakan, a little bit of an extra boost in movement and speed for both these champions. And of course, increasing that range for someone like Rakan and what he's able to do. You slap in a Zin Zhao, who's just, you know, using his abilities to move on through the jungle as well and get on through those lanes. Absolutely was fully enabled for Fnatic. And this felt very much like a Fnatic that felt the power level in game one against these Gigabyte Marines and realized, okay, we are just in all aspects better let's just flex on how good we are and show the outplays bet on our skill and that game too a lot of those fights a lot of those advantages picked up quickly and early from Fnatic. that is the case and feeling themselves just 
opting into every fight anywhere on the map resulted in uh, 32 kills in 27 minutes for Fnatic. Humanoid alone with 13 kills had more than Gam as an entire team. And it really, I mean, it was another good game from Razork on the Zin Zhao. Humanoid, as I mentioned, another follow-up performance. Emo, bless his heart, he was trying some things on this Tristana, but chalk this one into a classic Tristana mid-game where guys are feeling themselves a little bit too much and you're left scratching your head. Yeah, it's an instance where you're trying to do something, trying to find that clawback, trying to find that counterpunch that can give you that standing ground in this in this game which you're quickly losing any type of ground to stand on and have a fight back and have a chance in that series. That desperation can lead to plays like that where you do roll that dice, you roll that risk and the chances of coming out on top aren't so high and that's unfortunately how it looks for emo in this situation because yes the advantages are just way too much for a fanatic at that point you laid out humanoid the amount of kills that he picked up in this game i'm pretty sure he ends up with something like 13 kills by the end of it that uh, that way is doing a heck of a lot of painting out there i'll tell you that and it uh i mean yeah that first game there's a baron sneak from gam that's really the only point where they're, they're not even in control because they hardly get any uh, actual advantages on that Baron power play. So pretty much never in doubt Fnatic start to finish, get the 2-0 to win and head to that winner's side of the bracket. Other part of Group B action, top esports versus loud. And uh, obviously lots of fun matchups here. 369 and Robo. 369 with one of the best uh, lines in this teaser, by the way, coming into this day. It says... Everyone can enjoy the food in China. That's about it, because the trophy's here for us. Okay, okay, Mr. 369. Damn, like a pure on villain Thanos type of level line coming straight on from 369. Gameplay, backing it up at a Thanos level from Mr. 369 as we step into this series against Loud Esports. You get... Pretty, pretty favorable for Loud early to mid game at this point because you are getting some brawls. You are getting some fighting. You are getting some action. And you're getting a couple of mistakes on the side of top esports that you better believe. Yes, Loud is capitalized on. Put themselves in a better position, relatively standing ground until, unfortunately, Cream starts to find the angles on the Azir. And that Azir is going to be a, a theme for him in this series because you better believe you can't let someone like Cream get that type of comfort that the Azir pick offers him. And honestly, it wasn't just the Azir. This is like the most standard draft across the board for top esports. Comfort picks around Tien on the Viego, Jackie Love on Senna, and then Mako on that Tom Kench. Credit where credit is due, though, for Loud. Number one, Robo more than held his own in the laning phase against 369. And even when they were falling behind in gold, Loud was not afraid to take some fights. They were not afraid to scrap and get down in the gutter uh, with top esports. And as a result, they actually got some advantages throughout this game. I think the important takeaway for Loud at this point in this series, and we'll get to game two, of course, in a little bit, is that you were able to, from behind most of the time, right? Because you have that edge for top esports, whether it's coming from 369, whether it was what Tian was doing and how he was going around. Heck, even throwing Jackie Love Senna, which is one of those ones which has a mixed history, of course, because we've seen some incredible plays from that Senna. We've also seen it's, it's a full coin flip. It's either amazing or disaster. Yeah, I'm just going to leave that one up to you to figure out how bad it can get on the Senna for Jackie Love at that point. But it was pretty good from him. But you're talking about it from Loud because Loud found proactive angles to get a little punch in, to get a little bit of gold here, a little bit of gold here, and find advantages to keep it more interesting later on into the game, to have that angle, to have that question mark lingering on can top esports close this out Yes, they do today. Not as definitive as an answer as I think a lot of people would have wanted given how respected Top Esports and that number two seed from the LPL was heading into today. Yeah, still took them over 30 minutes to finally knock down the Nexus against Loud in that first game. Uh, game two, now we're basically averaging one a series. We get a little bit of a lane swap and loud obviously all these teams know now going into this event that lane swapping is going to be part of the strategy at some point they handled it pretty well to decent success because both teams their 80 carries 
got crazy ahead early, and that's kind of the point of lane swapping. Yeah, that's what you want. That's where you get that a little bit of acceleration, that bit of extra oomph in your team fight, hopefully towards that middle part of the map. That's the problem though for this one for loud because yes this is another game where it does have a bit of that scrappy skirmishing mentality you get top esports a couple kills loud gets their answer back one or two and find that angle with that proactive decision making that leads to my problem number one the big mistake for me is early in this mid early mid game type of situation around that you know upper uh mid jungle area and you've got ten owns getting a kill that's fantastic getting that aurelian soul a kill getting up some stacks the cost is trading one immediately right back over to cream on the azir so you've just negated what you gained on that aurelian soul and then you stick around a little bit longer to try and get one or two more stacks on the passive and you have to end up burning your flash redbird dies of course earlier that is not the situation and from that point on that little bit of a boost, that little bit of a setback for the side of Loud was more than enough to give uh, Top Esports that gap they needed to start smacking that wallet on you, start smacking the wallet on the door, start smacking that wallet on your Nexus. Yeah, as soon as Jackie Love picks up a couple of kills and is able to kind of have free reign in these team fights, that paired, we know how lethal Callista is on her own right, but paired with the Renata, Glasgow to Mako, having that bailout constantly hovering around him, it was just hop city for Jackie Love in these team fights later on. We've seen relatively strong performances early from the ADCs from this bottom lane at, you know, very limited sample size for this MSI. That Jackie Love uh, performance on the Callista is the most intimidating, is the scariest one that we have seen so far. It's laying down that gauntlet where I think even if you're looking at this series, you're feeling relatively positive about Loud, especially heading into that loser's bracket situation for them. But for top esports, yes, you did show some firepower. Yes, you showed you can hit that gas pedal a little bit and get it going but you haven't shown enough of that closing, enough of that killer mentality, which you need to have at this edge to take down these best teams. And that's where it's tough in these stages to fully grade a squad like TES or even go back to yesterday and T1. When they're playing these weaker wildcard regions, it feels like they're playing like they don't need to be as locked in as they do against top tier teams. Yeah, and part of that played in yesterday is what we talked about with of course, T1 mostly against Astralian. That's kind of one of those ones where coming off of the backs of the LCK Championship against that run, what it was that fight against Hanwha Life, what it was with Gen G, it was that step down and realizing, of course, that lock in for the players cannot be the type of same, but knowing it is MSI, you hoped it would be, still see a little bit more scrimmy, a little bit more for fun type of attitude and, and environment. That's going to change. Tomorrow, mighty quick, when we've got the winner's bracket side rolling on through for our games. And at least going forward now for Loud, when you look at that loser side, they should be big, 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 big favorites against GAM Esports. I I'm expecting them to 2-0 them. Massive, massive. They should be able to, and I think that's kind of the expectation from what you have seen with this one. Specifically, I'm going to find it really tough for the Gigabyte Marines to find avenues to get back into it because, yes, back into it because there are going to be advantages early and there are going to be many of them picked up by the side allowed from what we've seen in what we expected the discrepancy to be here at this point. It's going to be that uphill battle for the Gigabyte Marines. And you know that Loud is going to be fired up from the last time they matched up internationally, GAM as well, and obviously the pride of the CB Law. I'm expecting them to come out guns blazing in that loser's bracket. But before we're chatting losers, we get the top of the table heading into day three of MSI action. So we got to look ahead because these matchups level up real quickly. FlyQuest, great job. You bounce back for the reverse sweep against PSG. Now you get T1 on the docket. So we're going to try and go through the madness and paint that one angle in the maze where FlyQuest can come away with an upset. And it's so strange with FlyQuest because you have so you know two completely polar opposite sides of this team where you've got veterans like Buipo, Jensen, Inspired, 
multiple international events, multiple, heck, multiple domestic seasons under their belt compared to the likes Masu Busio. Very young bot lane, very inexperienced in this type of regard, very green up against competitors at the level of T1 in this case. And that's going to be the tough angle here because if you're talking about Masu and Busio, it's all about experience. How do you check up? How do you stack up? What can you learn? What type of, you know, all these things. You just got to soak it up like a sponge and try to do that debrief after and pick apart what you can bring into your game, bring into your training regimen, all these type of things from this experience. On the side of Whippo Inspire, Jensen, you know it. You've experienced it. You've been all the way through here. You've been, luckily enough, to be part of the very few NA teams that have had a moment where they clap back against the LCK. You've also been clapped quite a few times is the other problem when you're looking at that one. So for FlyQuest, you got to look at those three, those veterans. You got to lean on them to have a strong individual performance. They need to step up, bring you an X factor to bridge what is going to be the bottom lane gap of Gumayushi and Kyria, their experience, whether you're talking about general in their career, internationally, or heck, even just at an MSI tournament, you can narrow it down for them, and they're beaten up on Masu and Busio. That's where the biggest gap is going to be for me, and you got to find a way to stabilize that if you are FlyQuest. Even though we're feeling great about Masu after that first performance against PSG, the answer... The tiny angle, it's a tiny angle, of course, for FlyQuest here. If Zeus continues to underperform the way he has, that's where you've got to attack. Whether that means Whippo, Spam and Urgot, or some other spicy pick, counter pick in the top lane, or you're looking at a lane swap, which we know Zeus has not been comfortable with. You heard Inspired talking about lane swaps in general, saying it usually favors the weaker team because it puts the map into chaos and other squads are more likely to make mistakes even if they are a good team. FlyQuest is the weaker team. I'm not so sure T1 Macro is going to be making mistakes in these lane swaps, especially because they've been doing them themselves. That That's going to be the question. And I think at that point, it's got to be creativity coming from the side of FlyQuest. And you're going to have to take some risks as well with that creativity as far as your decision making, what you're going to push, what you will take, what you will trade in these games to try and force that type of mental mistake from T1 where they're on that back foot, they're on that tough location, got to make a quick choice and then make the wrong one type of situation at that point. Because if they're given time to make that calculated move, you're going to be read pretty darn quickly and it's going to be T1 dispatching you at that point. I love that you bring up Whippo and Zeus in the top lane because yes, haven't seen Zeus at quite the same power levels that we know that he can reach, of course, with his potential. But Whippo, we saw that potential. We saw that Urgot dominate type of one, making me eat my words. I said I wasn't really all that impressed, all that excited about Urgot from Whippo as his little interesting angle, his little pick coming on through it. Heck, I'm hella interested seeing that now, given that Urgot performance that we got from him just a short day ago. Bring that into this series. Bring that type of mentality as well. Bring inspired in your back pocket as well for that top lane. And again, the other angle for doing a lane swap, if you're not going for this Urgot counter pick, is you avoid the 2v2. Because Guma and Kyria, I don't care how good Masu and Busio looked in that first round. Guma and Kyria, one of the best bot lanes in the world, especially in that laning phase. And if there's an angle where you can avoid that, maybe, just maybe, that's the recipe for FlyQuest to come away with something. Because even gold team fighting, you ain't ever coming away with the win against this roster of T1. Fnatic versus Top Esports, the other winner's bracket. I'm going to give Fnatic a better chance of the upset here than FlyQuest by a little bit, but not by much. Um, my problem is I'm seeing some nightmares. I'm feeling the boogeyman vibes coming from Tian in the jungle, and that's why I'm feeling it is because I was feeling great about Razor and the performance and way that he looked today for Fnatic. This is a key sign, indicator, that this is gonna be a Fnatic that means business, that is gonna be a serious team at this event, that one that will be operating close to their prime level because Razor is involved, he is popping off. That is a big key for that Fnatic team. Running up an EU jungler, feeling hot, feeling good, feeling you know like they're on top of the world. That is in exactly the invite that Tian loves to see at his door to make a splash and make a big just, one. 
Don't let him get Viego. The whole series, do not let Tien play Viego. Yeah, uh, and don't let Jackie Love get Callista at this point. I think you got to be very careful with the Draven, of course, knowing what he's capable on that champion just in general. Maybe. Cautious, maybe, because I still think that he is going to have that power. Maybe you see what you saw from the Dravens yesterday and go, okay, Dravens weren't so threatening, so lethal. Maybe we leave it up. Jackie Love ain't playing Draven like that. I was going to say that is the risk that you take if you're going up against a guy like Jackie Love who's got the skills that he has. Jackie Love and Noah is the most hyped matchup uh, in this series, though, because both have been playing super well, not just this tournament so far, but the end of the splits in their respective regions as well. Very excited for that one. That is absolutely bringing the high octane firepower that you want in that bottom lane. And of course, it's not just about those ADCs. You slap in the support buddies alongside them and what they're able to do. Uh, you know, Mako and Jun, they bring some creativity, some extra flash into the bottom lane. What about the top lane? Because my question for you is going to be, where do you think is the bigger mismatch? Where is the more concern for you? Is it Busio and Masu against Gumuyushi and Kiria? Or are you looking at Oskirin up against your man 369 in the top side? I mean, if 369 is just playing Cassante and Orn, then it's pretty easy for Oscarin to just kind of coast by in the laning phase at the very least. But as soon as we see, I don't know, a Quinn or some pocket pick come out of oh, 369, no. I'm terrified if you're fanatic. Don't don't let me see a Fiora. No Fiora. No LPL Fiora. Is please. it Camille time? Haven't been seen Camille oh. yet. I wasn't even thinking about the Camille angle. Oh, God, this could be... Crazy in that top side. That's got to be one where Oskirin steps up, brings the big boy pants for his matchup against Tien, uh, against excuse me three six nine. And I say Tien because yeah, you better believe that <laughs> he's going to be giving gonna him be, attention. It's not just going to be three six nine. Mister Tien is going to make sure that path thing is up into the top side as well. Serious level up. The matches are heating up now, though, for winner's bracket. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beautiful people. Thank you for hanging out, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.